Okay, guys, a bunch of people have asked me to watch the latest Netflix documentary, The Bleeding Edge, and it is about medical devices and how they are killing us. What I wanna do now is cut through some of the hype because like pretty much every documentary on Netflix, this one has an agenda going in and it is very, very intense. It's basically saying that medical devices such as Bayer's Esher to prevent pregnancy, vaginal mesh, the Da Vinci robot, cobalt containing metal on metal hip replacements, these have been killing and injuring and maiming scores of people and the FDA is complicit and doctors are complicit and the sky is falling, okay. Well, like anything, there is a lot of truth to these hyperboles, but there's also a lot of nuance that I wanna talk about. The, the, the Netflix documentary, which you should watch, it's done very well, it makes you feel very emotional because you connect with the characters in the story. What we wanna do is look at the actual science and the truth behind what might be happening in a bigger picture. And this is for both doctors and patients. The documentary really focuses a lot on the eSure device, which is a coil that obstetricians can place into the fallopian tubes of women to prevent pregnancy. The idea is it blocks the tubes and prevents sperm from going inside. Now this is an alternative to tubal ligation where you actually make an incision and you tie off the fallopian tubes. That's the more gold standard old approach. Well, <clears throat> a lot of women electively were saying, well, I don't want the scar and I don't want the incision, let's try this device. The way the device was approved is one of two pathways for medical devices that the FDA has, and it's different than for pharmaceuticals. A lot of people don't understand this, and the documentary tries to explain some of this. The pathway that this device took was called the PMA, or uh, pre-market authorization pathway. It means that some studies are done, they tend to be a little smaller, they're not necessarily long-term, using the device to make sure it's safe and effective. Now, that's the more rigorous of the pathways that medical devices use. And the device was approved, it was used for uh, uh, quite a few years, and then a bunch of adverse events started being reported. People having pain, bleeding, inflammation, and these things were actually listed in the potential complications for the device, but a lot of times these weren't explained to patients or it wasn't made clear, or honestly patients come expecting great things from our newest technology and they don't listen to the complications, they don't hear it, and that's normal human sort of functioning. So then stories started coming out about the devices being placed inappropriately, a lot of failures, people getting pregnant, Facebook groups were formed uh, with women who have had complications from the device, and it became a very, very uh, big deal because these patients collectively have a big voice. At that point, Bayer, the producer of the eSure device, sort of pushed back and said, no, it's safe, we did the trials, et cetera. Well, let's dig into this. The, <clears throat> the, the documentary will make it seem like there's no benefit and it's, it's terrible across the board and devices are poorly regulated, et cetera, but there's more truth to it. For many people, the device did work, but as David Magnus, the director for the uh, Center of uh, Biomedical Ethics at Stanford told me, the trials that are done to approve these devices are often funded by the companies, so Bayer. So there's already a kind of a financial conflict of interest. Bayer wants to show a positive result that the thing works. So what do they do is they design a trial that is idealized. In other words, doctors who are well-trained to place the device are used, the patients are recruited very carefully, the device is placed under perfect circumstances, there's good follow-up with a hysterostyle salpingogram to make sure the device is placed right and that it is uh, a blocking the fallopian tube, they use alternative contraception for three months, which is uh, recommended, and they follow up, and guess what? The results are very positive, 99% uh, effective in preventing pregnancy. Well, that's pretty good compared to a tubal ligation, that's great. So what happened in the real world? In the real world, many patients didn't get the follow-up hysterosalpingogram. In, in the real world, many physicians maybe didn't place the device right, or there's a sales rep from Bayer sitting in the room going, well, you know what, the first device didn't go in, put in another one, and they're putting in multiple devices. Now remember, these reps aren't doctors, but doctors have to rely on them for information from the manufacturer, and that's another tricky piece. The doctors also feel like, well, the FDA studied this, so it's probably safe and effective, so I can place it, but they don't realize the limitations of the original trials. So in the real world, over periods of longer follow-up, in trials that were not sponsored by Bayer, up to maybe a 10% failure rate. Tubal ligation, the gold standard, is much better than that. So this is how we can actually fail to predict what a device is actually gonna do when it's in circulation. Now, does this mean the sky is falling and, and you know, everything is terrible? No, it means we need to do a better job of understanding as clinicians 
what the primary data actually shows, and then explaining to our patients carefully, and this may be a multi-step process, especially for elective procedures, what are the risks? And as patients, we need to be asking, how many of these have procedures have you done? Are you good at this? What are the complications you've seen? Is there any resources I can read that are vetted online to actually understand what this is? And as docs, we need to look at the primary data. So the eSure device is a great cautionary tale of how idealized trials really aren't the best. We ought to be doing pragmatic trials, trials that simulate what would happen in the real world. Now, the second thing that the documentary kind of really points out is that we're not really good at reporting adverse events when they happen out in the world. So the, the device is approved through the PMA pathway, and it turns out that things are happening, but they're maybe underreported. And they use a term in, in, they use a number in the documentary of 5% of all adverse events are reported. Now, I haven't confirmed that number, but we know that it is low. So one thing doctors can do, they're not mandatorily required to report adverse events they see. Either they should be, or we should do it voluntarily. We should go directly to the FDA site and report, because although the manufacturers are technically required to report, report severe adverse events, are you gonna really put all your trust in that? I would go directly to the FDA. So that's another piece of this is the post-marketing surveillance. Are we seeing what's happening in our patients? One of the examples in the, in the movie was a doctor who had a metal on metal, he was an orthopod, had metal on metal hip implanted in himself. He's done these to patients. The metal, the metal includes cobalt. He started having neurologic symptoms months later, getting really weird signs of dementia. Had a imaging of his hip, had the hip removed. It had disintegrated, the metal had dissolved, and his blood levels of cobalt were sky high. Well, it turns out this had been reported increasingly. The product was removed, that particular product, and now, actually, rheumatologists are taught in certain uh, uh, settings look for high blood cobalt levels in people who've had these devices placed because they can mimic dementia and we could be institutionalizing people for a reversible cause. When you take the hip out, it gets better. Well, this is how post-marketing surveillance should work. Now, here's a question. Why did that metal-on-metal -metal hip device get implanted in the first place? Why did the FDA think that was okay? The second pathway that the FDA uses to approve devices is something called the 510K pathway. Medical device manufacturers, and by the way, this is a multi-billion dollar industry on par with pharmaceuticals, right? But less heavily regulated by FDA. They, they went to FDA in the early days and said, you know what, if, if we make revisions to a device and it's substantially similar to previous devices that are used for similar applications, we shouldn't have to go through a full clinical trial process to prove that it works. We should be allowed to innovate without having to go through all this time and expense and get these things in front of patients quicker. Now, there's some truth to that, but what ends up happening? Well, if metal on polyethylene uh, hips are good, metal on metal hips are substantially similar, why don't we go ahead and get a 510 exemption, which means they're substantially similar to previous devices? Expedite it through, start using them. Oops, there are adverse events that we didn't predict because we didn't do a long enough, extensive, pragmatic trial. On top of that, a lot of the trials that are done, again, are sponsored by the companies that are making the device. And there is always gonna be conflict of interest and bias in that. The third piece that the, that the documentary focuses on is FDA conflict of interest. Many of the high levels of FDA have worked in industry, and when they leave FDA, they go back to industry. Now, you need to understand the industry you're regulating in order to be a regulator. This is true, but this revolving door could be a serious problem. Maybe we need to allow it to revolve only once, and you can't just keep going back to industry. That would kind of change behavior. So there is definitely truth to that. There's also truth that the 510K pathway for medical devices that many doctors don't even understand exists is not a very rigorous way to prove safety and e efficacy. I'm gonna give you one example. I have a friend who uh, is a physician and she was suffering with some incontinence and, and prolapse that came with getting older, having multiple children, that sort of thing. And she had an obstetrician who she trusted uh, to take care of her. This obstetrician had a brand new device that was approved through the 510K process called the, they marketed as Mona Lisa Touch creepy. It's an intravaginal laser that is supposed to remodel the vaginal wall, create better tension so that there's less prolapse, less incontinence, less painful intercourse, those kind of things. Well, uh, it's marketed he heavily and the doctors believe it probably works because there's very small case study trials 
that are not really sufficient at all, and they're not compared to placebo, right? And the device was approved because it was very similar to a laser that burns off warts. And as a result, they're marketing it to women and they're doing it. Well, this person got the thing done, maybe had a placebo response, felt a little better. The doctor said, well, you need to come back every six months to have a revision. It's $2,000 every time. And she was happy to do it until the FDA just released a letter saying, hey, guess what? There's no evidence that this actually works. And we've had reports of harm from people reporting bleeding, uh, pain, uh, those kind of uh, you know, burns from the laser malfunctioning, that kind of thing. So guess what? Maybe not the best idea. Hey, it would have been nice to understand that before. It would have been nice to look at science before we aggressively market to patients whatever is the newest, best thing. And you know what? Even as a doctor, she felt trust. It's almost a shamanic relationship we have with our doctors, with her obstetrician who she loved and trusted. And she didn't question and she said, well, if she thinks this is a good idea, I'm gonna do it. And even after the FDA letter came out, she still wanted to go and get the repeat procedure because she was like, well, I don't wanna make my doctor mad. This is the heart of many of our problems. As clinicians, we can't accept that innovation by itself is, may not be a good thing because we're conditioned to believe that, you know what, if we can do it, we probably should do it, and it's probably better, and we trust the FDA and we trust authority. We shouldn't, we should question everything, we should look at the primary data. If we're doing this as a marketing thing and you're trying to make money to support your practice, think hard about how we really need to understand what we're doing to people instead of for people. As patients, we need to question everything, but we also need to do it in the context of a deep relationship with our healthcare practitioner, because that is the heart of it, being able to have an honest, open discussion and say, how many of these have you done? Have you seen complications? What's the primary data? Those kind of questions are important. Now, it's so easy because clinicians need so little data to put a device in and so much data to take it out. They need to be proven to them that they didn't cause this harm, right? That's how it is. We're conditioned to feel like I couldn't have caused this complication. We need to do better. So here are my calls to action. If you're a patient, question things, do some research, ask questions of your doctor, let them curate your experience. And if you feel like you're being marketed to or pushed, walk away and get a second opinion. If you're a clinician, you need to look at the primary data, understand how the FDA works through the PMA and the 510K process. They're not very rigorous. Question everything. Look at the primary trials and see if you're convinced that this is safe and effective. And if you're seeing adverse events, please report them directly to the FDA and the manufacturer. We're gonna leave links in the blog post. And if, you, if we can do this and we can address our own biases, then there will be no need to make pretty inflammatory documentaries like The Bleeding Edge that are then gonna present to the public a very one-sided and emotionally charged argument. If we got our stuff together, both as patients and doctors, we could do so much better to reduce medical errors, reduce complications, and make our medical devices what they're intended to be, which is life-changing, beneficial things that can improve suffering. And that's what they can do. That's what they often do. And the, and the documentary doesn't show. And we can do better to make this happen. Please hit share. Tell your friends. And by the way, I did convince that friend not to get more of that procedure. And if you are involved in Mona Lisa Touch, look at the primary data. All right, guys, we out. Hit share.